So the day is August the 25th, 2050. And Judith Aberg was sipping her morning coffee and looking forward to what she expected to be a normal day at work. Her office stretched across six blocks of Fifth Avenue in New York City, and it overlooked Central Park. But her employer was not the white shoe investment bank that you think would occupy such coveted real estate. Instead, she worked for Mount Sinai, one of the biggest teaching hospitals in the United States. And Judith served as the chief of the Division for Infectious Diseases not only treating patients herself, but running a team of dozens of people committed to improving patients' lives. But August the 25th, 2015, was no ordinary day. The Mount Sinai Hospital Pharmacy did a routine reorder of a bottle of pills. That should have been a day-to-day -day activity. But when they called up the company to buy the pills, they found that their credit limit was not high enough. And Judith said, surely there must be some mistake. Our credit limit is $40,000. That should be clearly enough to finance one bottle of just 100 pills. Because Judith thought, well, each pill should cost $13.50. So a bottle shouldn't cost that much more than 1000 But she was shocked to find that just overnight, they'd increased the price of these pills from $13.50 to $750 for a single pill. 5,500% increase overnight. Who did this? It was the manufacturer of these pills, a company called Turing Pharmaceuticals. Now, Turing Pharmaceuticals, this was named after Alan Turing, the famous mathematician who broken the code of the Enigma machines used by the Germans in the Second World War. But while Turing the mathematician was driven by innovation to break boundaries, Turing, the company, was not driven by innovation at all. Their mission wasn't to come up with new drugs to transform people's lives for the better. It instead was to buy existing drugs, jack up their prices, and restrict their supply. And who was the person in charge of Turing? Somebody who you'll, most of you will know his name. It's Martin Shkreli, who became one of the most hated uh, men in U US business. He used to be a hedge fund manager. But he decided that even hedge funds didn't give him enough money. So he thought more money was to be made in pharmaceuticals, but not inventing new drugs, buying existing ones, and jacking up the price. Why did he do this? What was his mentality? Now, it would be too easy for me to say, well, that he was just a greedy person who was evil and only cared about profits. That's how he's portrayed. But his mentality was a little different to that, and I'm going to now try to drill down these nuances. Now, Shkreli saw that the value that a company produces through selling drugs has been captured by a pie. Now, part of the pie, part of the value that a company gets by selling pharmaceuticals goes to investors, and investors take what's known as profit. Now, it's important to stress that investors are not nameless, faceless capitalists, even though they're normally portrayed in that way. Investors can include parents saving for their children's education. They can include an insurance company laying aside to be able to finance future claims on the insurance. Or they can include a, a pension fund saving for their retirees. So investors are an important part of society, and profits are important. But profits are not the only part of the pie. The pie also includes workers. What do they get from a company? Not just a salary, even though that's important, but a sense of purpose, uh, some colleagues, and um, a chance to make a difference in the world. It also includes customers, suppliers, the environment, the government through tax revenues, and also local community. Now, collectively, all of those other members of the pie, other than investors, are often called stakeholders. Okay? So investors matter. But also, there's the view that companies can create value for stakeholders. Now, how Shkreli viewed the pie was he viewed the pie as fixed. The amount of value that a company generates is fixed. And he also view viewed his mission, his purpose, to make as much money for investors as possible. Now, if the pie is fixed, 
And if your goal is to get the greatest slice for yourself, what is the way you do this? Well, if there's a pizza at a party, you just take slices from everybody else. And so what Shkreli wanted to do is to take the slices away from stakeholders by, uh, and then therefore give as much as possible to investors. And how Shkreli did this was he jacked up the prices for customers. But there are other ways of doing this. And unfortunately, we have some examples here in the UK. So Sports Direct was accused of, of exploiting their workers through zero hours contracts and working them too hard, not letting them take breaks, again, reducing how much of the pie that they are getting. So this is what I call the pie splitting mentality. If you see the pie as being fixed, then what you want to do is oppress everybody else in order to get as much as possible for yourself. And notice that the fixed pie mentality is not just possessed by CEOs like Mike Ashley of Sports Direct or Martin Shkreli of Turing. It is also viewed by politicians and policymakers and ordinary citizens who quite understandably want to make sure that the environment and customers and workers are well treated. If indeed you see companies as evil people who are trying to grab more of the pie, right, then you want to make sure that we're not in this situation, you want to reduce their profits. And indeed, this is how citizens are responding. This is why trust in business is at an all-time low, and so voters and the policymakers that, they're represent that are representing them, they are taking action. Now, the precise form of that action may vary. Occupy movements, Brexit, restrictions on CEO pay, more regulation. But regardless of the specific form, the mentality is the same. It is them against us. We want more for ourselves, the orange, and we want less for others. We don't want to be in this situation here. And notice that this is not just a problem right now in 2018. This has been a problem throughout history. Cast your mind back to the late 19th century, where you had the robber barons who created massive monopolies, such as Standard Oil, making huge amounts of profits. What happened afterwards? Well, they got broken up so that more value would go to stakeholders. Or cast your mind back to the increase in trade union power over much of the 20th century, trying to create value for workers. And then they were hit by, regulation, by a different legislation, and therefore more of the pie went to investors. Or let's cast your mind back to the financial sector. In the 1920s, banks became much more powerful and took a lot of profit for investors. And then that led to the financial crisis in 1929, and regulation like the Glass-Steagall Act, swinging the pendulum back in favor of society. But then you had a worse a weakening of regulation, and that continued almost unabated until the financial crisis. And then we're going to see a swing back the other way, where we're going to see some regulation again to protect society. So what we've seen throughout history is the pendulum swinging backwards and forwards. Investors and society are enemies. They're squabbling over a fixed pie. And therefore, just the relationship between business and society is fraught. It's a hostile one. And what you want to do is you just want to advocate for your team, either us or them. So you're going to vote for politicians who are either going to promise to reduce regulation and get more profit, or politicians to increase regulation. And we've seen this play so many times. And unless we find a different way where business and society can work together, this movie will continue to be played for decades and centuries to come. But the good news is that there is another way. And this is what this lecture and this lecture series is about. In 1978, William Campbell. He was a research scientist at Merck Pharmaceuticals. And he made this amazing discovery, which was that ivermectin, this was a drug that Merck had developed to treat uh, parasites within livestock, that might be able to treat a human disease called onchocerciasis. So this was also known as uh, river blindness. So with this disease, why was it called river blindness? Well, it was transmitted by the black fly. Now, the black fly was teeming around the riverbanks in Latin America and uh, Africa. 
where people were now living because the ground was very fertile. Now, a single bite from the black fly would inject in a person the tapeworm called Onchocerca volvulus, and this is what it looked like. These tapeworms could grow to nearly two feet long. They lived under the skin, and they could live there for up to 10 to 15 years. And once you had one of these tapeworms, they caused severe itching. And in some cases, that itching was so severe that people would commit suicide. That was the only way to stop the itching. In other cases, these tapeworms, that led to um, some lava. And that lava would invade the eyes and cause people to go blind. And this was known as river blindness. And the impact on blindness was devastating. This would lead to sometimes an entire community going blind by the late 20s or early 30s. And so children had to lead adults in single file through the, the farmlands in which they lived. Now, at the time of the discovery, river blindness was suffered by 18 million people in the world. And about 100 million more people were at risk. And these were in 34 countries. And importantly, these were in some of the most poor countries in the entire world. Now, William Campbell, he only came up with a hypothesis. Maybe we could use ivermectin to treat river blindness. But it was only a hypothesis. It had to be tested. And the odds on this becoming successful were really, really massive. Antiparasitic drugs typically did not succeed across species. And even if they did develop it, They'd have to find a way to get it through approval and make sure it doesn't have side effects and find a way to manufacture it and distribute it to these far-flung countries. And even then, Merck might not be able to make money because these were the poorest countries in the world. The people lived in huts made of mud. They wore skirts made from grass. So how would it be that Merck would make any money? But this wasn't Merck's concern. Merck wasn't thinking about how to make money. They thought how to serve society. How do we grow the pie and make a difference to customers and community? So they decided to launch a trial in humans under Dr. Mohammed Aziz, launched in Senegal. And what this trial found was that a single tablet that cured the disease, that got rid of all of the parasites without any side effects. It was almost too good to be true. So unbelievable that the World Health Organization, which looked at the results, they thought there must be some mistake here. But then Dr. Aziz, he ran other trials in other African countries over the next few years, and that found the same results. So six years later, after the first trial in 1987, um, then the drug, ivermectin, known under the brand name Mectizan, this was given approval for use in humans. But there was still a problem. The situation in West Africa hadn't changed. The government still couldn't afford to pay for the drug. And so Roy Vagelos, who was the CEO of Merck at the time, he asked, would the World Health Organization help? Would government foreign aid departments help? None of them had the money, nor did private foundations. So what did Roy do? He took a crazy decision. He decided to give this drug away for free. He announced this in October 1987. He said, we will give as much as needed, for as long as needed, to anyone anywhere in the world suffering from river blindness. Because we believe that this disease is so debilitating that it doesn't matter what it costs, we're going to get this to the people who need it. He partnered with the World Health Organization, with the World Bank and the UNICEF, in order to get this drug. And as of today, it's still running. It's, in fact, the longest-running disease-specific drug donation program in history. And it's transformed lives. There have been 2.7 billion treatments. Now it gets to 300 million people per year. And as a result, the World Health Organization has certified four countries within Latin America as having eliminated river blindness, this cruel disease. Now, why did Merck do this? Notice that they did it purely out of concern for these communities. But the nice end of the story is that Merck's also benefited from this, because Merck is seen as an extremely reputable company which attracts a lot of stakeholders. 
A few months after the decision in October 1987, Merck was lauded as the best in public service by Business Week. Fortune called Merck America's most admired company. And while you might think that shareholders would have complained, right? If you've got a drug which changes people's lives, sell it and make as much money as possible. Don't give it away for free. But he reported that 10 years afterwards, not a single shareholder had complained about this program. And many employees actually joined Merck and wrote to Merck saying that they joined it due to this program. So maybe they had higher offers of higher salaries at other places, but they wanted a company with a commitment to using science to transform people's lives. And so Merck today is one of the, still one of the most admired com companies in the world and an extremely successful one, both financially, but also in terms of its mission and its societal contribution. So, how is this mentality different? Well, I've alluded to this a little bit previously, but what it viewed was uh, the pie as not being fixed. What Vagelos and Campbell and Aziz viewed the pie as is something that's expandable. Their mission was to grow the pie. And if you grow the pie by giving a larger share to stakeholders, actually investors benefit. Merck is an extremely profitable company today. But I think this fundamentally changes the way in which business and society should interact. They are no longer squabbling over a fixed pie. Anything I get is at your expense. Instead, by working together, they can expand the pie. And even though stakeholders benefit, Investors may ultimately benefit as well due to the enhanced reputation that Merck was able to enjoy. Now, when I show you this, you might immediately have a few objections. You might think, well, this is too good to be true. Why is it, okay, magically, if stakeholders are better off, investors are better off, but does that always work? Well, I'm going to show you some evidence that this is not an isolated case uh, later on in this lecture. And you might also have the objection, does this mean that companies should just care about creating value for society, not even care about profit, and then that, that's a way to run a company? No, we don't want to go towards the other extreme. But what I want to stress now is that the different way to do business is to find ways in which investors be are better off, but also society is better off. And this is what I call responsible business. So what is a responsible business? So the obvious way to see it, based on what I've just shown you, is that a responsible business is one that is profitable, but it's profitable as a result of creating value for society, as a result of growing the pie, rather than a business that just happens to be profitable. So it does earn profits. And again, I stress that profits are a good thing. But profits are only a good thing if they're not taken from others if they're as a result of creating value for others. Now, that first point probably sounds kind of obvious, and you would have guessed that point without coming to this lecture. A responsible business is one that creates value, doesn't just focus on profit. But the next few points here are a little bit more nuanced. First, I'm going to argue that high profits are not necessarily a sign of irresponsibility. Right, so if a, me, if, a, if a news article wants to slam a company, they will say, oh, Apple's made X billion dollars per year. Or sometimes they'll say they've made this amount per minute or per second in order to get people angry. Or they might say, well, this CEO's earned X million dollars per year, again, to co convey that this is at the expense of everybody else. Now, it's indeed true that you can sometimes make profits at the expense of others. That's what Turing did. But note that you could also make profits as a result of serving others. Why is Apple worth over a trillion dollars? Because they've made products that have transformed cutters' lives, been dedicated to innovation and also to design. And as a byproduct, Apple made a lot, is, is worth a lot, and Steve Jobs, the founder, became wealthy. But that's not necessarily as a result of taking value for society but making products that have transformed society, many people without uh, these communication technologies would have a very different lives from what they have today. And also, it suggests, well, if high profits might sometimes be responsible, what is irresponsibility? At the moment, 
We think an irresponsible business is one that conducts what I'm going to call an error of commission, committing a bad act. This bad act might be mistreating your workers as sports directed. This bad act might be overpaying a CEO, or it might be engaging in a share buyback. And maybe those can be bad acts. But what I want to stress is the most irresponsible action that you can undertake is not an error of commission, doing something bad, but an error of omission, failing to do something good. So if Merck had not decided to take a punt and had this crazy idea of developing ivermectin for livestock and taking this to humans, what would the media backlash have been? There would have been no media backlash in the same way that sometimes right now companies get lambasted for paying the CO too much. Right? Nobody would have known about this, and yet the amount of lives that would have been transformed would have been so much less had Merck not decided to, um, to, to, to develop ivermectin. So the most irresponsible action that you can do is not necessarily splitting the pie differently, but failing to crow the pie, failing to innovate, failing to take risks. And so one example of a company which would be irresponsible under this definition was Kodak. So Kodak in the 1980s was sec the second most valuable company in the world, making millions of dollars from film. Now one of its rivals had actually been the first company to launch an electronic cam camera. Now Kodak could have responded to this. In fact, Kodak had a patent for the digital camera. But they thought, why would I bother? I'm already making so much money from selling film if I was to develop the digital camera, that could be risky and it's going to take many, many years. Let's take this short-term profit. And so as a result, Kodak has lost a substantial amount of value, became bankrupt, investors lost, and also employees lost their jobs. But again, at the time, or even many years later, Kodak never got the same media backlash as a company might get for earning profits. Even now, some people might see Kodak as an innocent victim of changes in technology, which were, they were just unlucky. When in fact, by being a complacent company which coasted, that is the main way in which you destroyed value. They made low profits, but low profits aren't a good thing, even though sometimes media will herald a company whose profits are for them. This was as a result of not creating value. So the most responsible actions that a company can do, what is a responsible business? is not to split the pie differently, but to innovate. That does increase profits, but it also benefits society. And so I want to restress this idea that this pie-splitting mentality, that business and society are enemies, that's not only possessed by bad leaders like Shkreli or Mike Ashley, but also by some advocates for business reform, arguing that what we want to necessarily do is stifle business and make sure that investors have as little as possible even though these constraints may, in many circumstances, mean that you don't innovate and don't create a lot of hidden light. Now, I'm going to get to the evidence shortly, but let me just have two um, points as to how this differs from many ways in which business is currently run. Now, Milton Friedman is arguably the second most famous economist of all time after John Maynard Keynes. And he's famous for his writings on monetary policy, how to set interest rates. And this is the bedrock behind central banks' thinking wor worldwide. But his most famous paper wasn't on monetary policy. It wasn't even an academic paper. It was a review, a newspaper article in the New York Times, where he argued that the social responsibility of business is to increase profits. All business should care about is to make as much money as possible. And this view is often caricatured. And people often say, well, this is the view that many people who run companies today and many investors and many hedge funds have that view. And people have the incentive to caricature that view as much as possible, paint that view as really extreme, and say, I have a new way of how to do business, and it's different. And by caricaturing, the old view is really extreme. It's easy to beat that straw man and knock it down and argue that your way of seeing the world is better. But I think caricaturing other views 
is not helpful because this is actually not what reality is, and this is not what Milton Friedman meant. So he did argue that the social responsibility of business is to increase profits, but notice why his view was different from the pie-splitting mentality, because he said, well, actually, to increase profits, you might want to grow the pie. Right? If your goal is to increase profits, you prefer this outcome to that outcome. So he did see stakeholders as important. He was forward thinking. And he did realize that if you invest in your workers, they're going to be more productive and more motivated. If you invest in your customers, you have a great brand, then they're going to be more loyal. And if you pollute the environment, your brand reputation will be worse off. So he did see the pie as expandable. And he was much more forward-thinking than many people who like to caricature him give him credit for. However, what is the difference between his view, which I'm going to call enlightened shareholder value, and the idea of growing the pie? Enlightened shareholder value is instrumental. What I mean by that is you do invest in your workers, in your customers, and in the environment. But you do this all with an ulterior motive. You treat your workers well because you believe they'll be more productive. You will treat the environment better because you think it will improve your brand. And so every decision is reduced to a mathematical calculation. So let's take a hypothetical decision and see how Friedman reviewed this. So should Apple build a gym? Well, what Friedman would say is calculate the costs and benefits. The costs are, well, the cost of the gym itself but also the time that the workers spend in the gym away from work. What are the benefits? Well, the workers will be more productive, well, will be healthier. They're going to take less time off from being sick, and maybe that's going to give me this much more money. Maybe the workers will run into other colleagues in other departments in the gym, and they're going to synergize and create this much more profit. But as I can see from your expressions, right, there's no way you can calculate that number. How can you calculate the impact of healthier employees on your profit? There's no other way you can do that. And I know that finance professors like me, they love to reduce every decision to a mathematical calculation and take these decisions by reference to spreadsheets. And maybe you could have done that 100 years ago when your main assets were tangible things like factories, calculate the number of widgets the factory produces, how much profit you can sell the widget for, but you can't do that in the modern firm, where the main assets are not tangible bricks and mortar. They are your people. They are your brand. They're your reputation. They're your relationship with your supplier. And so how does the pie growing mentality differ? That their motivation is intrinsic. Here, you create value for your stakeholders because it's the right thing to do. Apple builds the gym not because it can instrumentally calculate the effect and profits, but because it believes that it should just be increasing the slice of the pie given to workers because it's going to be improving their health. And as a result of that, profits are a byproduct. Profits are still important, but profits are not the end goal. They're the result of doing other things well. And this leads to a shift in thinking. This means that you don't need to justify every single investment decision by looking at the effect it has on your bottom line. Many things that you can do for intrinsic reasons because you want to serve society, and then as a result, as a byproduct, they might be profitable in the long term. To be a successful business, you need to do things that your competitors are not doing. That involves making investments that your competitors are not making. And in a world in which every decision and every investment is justified according to a mathematical calculation, this involves taking in investments that cannot be justified with a mathematical calculation. The second way in which the way of viewing the world is different, before I get to the evidence, is the following. Now, you might think I was awfully convenient in my earlier example I talked about growing the pie where the slices were the same size. So it's obvious that if you grow the pie, everybody's better off. But the real world is not like that. Sometimes there's trade-offs. Maybe as a product of growing the pie, what you're giving some to stakeholders, the pie grows, 
but investors get a smaller slice, maybe because you're making more investments than you were before. And in this diagram, actually having a larger slice of a smaller pie is better than having a smaller slice of a larger pie. If your goal is to maximize profits, the blue, you might actually want to prefer this than this. So my assumption that you should just grow the pie doesn't actually hold. But actually, what I'm going to argue here is that even if all you care about is investors, you might prefer this to this, even though your slice is smaller. Why? Because investors are never just investors. Investors are also workers, customers, suppliers, they care about the environment. Because who are you investing on behalf of? It's either pensioners and retirees and savers themselves, or mutual funds or pension funds who are saving on behalf of people. And one of the most fundamental and simple principles of finance is that when you make any decision, what you care about is not the nominal amount of money, how much money you have in your bank account, five pounds or 10 pounds, you care about the real value, what you can do with the money. People know that maybe you'd prefer a lower salary outside of London, where the cost of living is lower, than a higher salary in London, where things are more expensive. We care about not just money because we're King Midas and we like looking at money, but we care about what you can do with the money. And so this is why, even if you care only about investors, you want to care about the rest, right? Because it could be that you're generating a lot of profit for your investors. But if you're doing this in a way that leads to water shortages, which leads to energy being scarce and energy prices being high, that is going to worsen the investor's standard of living. You invest because you want to provide for your own retirement or for your children if they are richer in, in financial terms, but the cost of living has gone up or society is much more fragmented, then actually their livelihoods are worse off. And these are serious consequences. The idea about caring about society is not just fluffy and idealistic. Even if you were a selfish investor, you would want to care about all of those things. So that's the end of my first part, which is the idea behind responsible business, which is pie growing. There's two more parts which are going to go much quicker. The evidence is what I've said just too good to be true. And the implementation how do we actually move beyond talking and put this into practice? So what is the evidence that actually companies that seek to grow the pie are profitable? Well, you might think, I've already shown you the evidence. I've told you about Merck. And Merck is one of the most successful companies in the world today, financially and also in terms of societal reputation. But that's not evidence at all. That's a single anecdote, a single case study. And you can always find an example to support whatever point you want to support. Me supporting responsible business, maybe I searched over every company and just found Merck, and I'm telling you about Merck because it happens to fit my story. And we must be extremely careful about that. Because we live in a world in which stories are extremely influential. Every TED talk starts with a story. Stories are used in books, stories are used in business schools like my own, they're called case studies. And you find the most extreme example of a case, and you teach this, and you want to make everybody believe that every, everything is like that. But again, you can always find a story to support any viewpoint. Even if the evidence is that smoking is bad for your health, you could find one story of a smoker who lives until 100 years old. Or even if, if education is good for your income, you could find one multimillionaire who did not go to university. So these isolated cases don't tell us anything because they're just handpicked. So what I need to do in order to convince you of the merits of the pie growing mentality is to look at the evidence, look at hundreds of companies across dozens of industries and in many time periods. And this is what I set out to do in one of my own papers that I started um, at the end of my PhD at uh, MIT. I wanted to look in general, are purposeful companies, do they do better in terms of profit, or are they just fluffy companies who are distracted from the bottom line? So the first question is to ask, well, how do I measure the extent to which a company is growing the pie? Now, I chose to focus on workers. They are not the only important slice, right? There's other slices. I'm going to come back to them later. But I chose to focus on workers because I had a really good measure available. 
which is the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, produced by the Great Place to Work Institute and now published by Fortune magazine. So this was a very good measure for a number of reasons. So I had 28 years of data because it started in 1984. And also, it's a very thorough measure. It looks at not only quantitative factors like pay and benefits, but also qualitative factors like trust and management, pride in your jobs, and camaraderie with your colleagues. So honestly, well, how do these companies perform? Well, you might think, well, there's a lot of problems with that. Well, let's say Google is on this list. Google did really well. But how do we know it's due to employee well-being? the fact that it treated its, its work as well. It could be that Google is just a tech company and tech just happened to do well. So for every company in this list, I had to control for what industry you're in, for the size of the company, for the growth opportunities, for recent performance and a whole host of other factors. And as you know, correlation does not imply causation. So I had to do further tests to suggest that it's employee well-being that leads to better financial performance rather than financial performance leading to your employees being happy. So it took me four years to complete the study, to verify the robustness of my results and to rule out alternative explanations. After all of that, what did I find? I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period. 89 to 184% cumulative, this is serious stuff. So companies that were treating their work as well, they weren't just reducing the slice to investors and giving it to employees, they were growing the pie for the benefit of all. Because these workers became more productive, you were able to att attract and retain the very best talent. That's workers. That's not the only slice of the pie. Here's another slice. Customers. So this looked at companies which did well in the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And the companies that did well in this index, they delivered returns that were triple the broader market. And again, this is not obvious. You might think, well, you want your customers to be happy. But you can increase your customer satisfaction by charging too low prices, having very generous after-sales service, and a generous return policy. All of those things you think might eat into profits and reduce their slice, but it grows the pie. Or what about the environment? This is a measure of eco-efficiency. That's the value that a company creates with its products and services compared to the waste that it generates, a bit like a bank for a buck. And again, companies that do well beat companies that do poorly by 5% per year. Now, all of those three studies, they take one type of stakeholder, workers, customers, the environment, and look at the value created to that stakeholder. Those are the measures of outputs of how a company acts. But another thing you can do is to look at the input into how a company acts. How does a company prioritize society to begin with? And this study here by my LBS colleague, Yanis Yanu, and two faculty from Harvard Business School, they looked at companies that implemented sustainability policy. A company might have a policy to reduce its water usage or to vet the human rights record of a supplier before engaging with the supplier. And what they found is that the companies with a lot of policies, sustainability policies, beat those with few over an 18-year period. But that's not the most interesting thing about this paper. The most interesting thing about the paper is they looked at companies that adopted these sustainability policies in 1992. Why is that so interesting? Well, that was before the sustainability movement became big. That was before companies were talking about CSR. So they weren't doing this for good public relations. They weren't doing this because of some regulation. They were voluntarily doing this because they wanted the businesses that they were running to be ones that created value for society rather than took for society. These were particularly forward-thinking, and in the long term, they became profitable, even though that was not the motivation for their action. I think this is really important. When I often talk to Asian companies about, um, about purposeful behavior, I often use this graph. 
Because maybe Asia in 2018 is a bit like the US was in 1992, where there's not so much demand or regulation for social responsibility, but I will companies who do this voluntarily, you end up creating more value for stakeholders and you become more profitable as a result. Your customers are more loyal, your workers are more motivated, and your environmental reputation will attract more customers and workers and, and investors. So I've got 20 minutes left, but I want to allow some time for Q&A, so I'm going to end um, with some implementation. Beyond talking, how do we put this into place? Now, the first thing to stress is excellence. What is the best way in which a company serves society? Simply by being excellent at what you do has a huge effect on not only your investors, <coughs> but also your customers, your employees, and the environment. And you might think, this is kind of obvious, right? no company would ever try not to be excellent. But I think it's far more nuanced than we other might think. But because, again, how do we view a responsible company often? We might view this as, again, as a company that reduces its CEO pay. Maybe it cuts its carbon emissions. Maybe it's more transparent about its taxes. And know that those are all good things, right? We care about other stakeholders. But what do I think is the most responsible thing that Vodafone has done? Vodafone has been a leader in some things in many ways. It was the first company to ever produce a tax transparency report about its contribution to public finances all over the world. And maybe Vodafone does things to reduce its carbon footprint. But the best thing that Vodafone did, in my opinion, was to launch M-Pesa. This was a mobile te a banking technology which in Kenya has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people lifting them out of poverty. They have now access to banking, which they never had before. And a lot of these people whose lives were changed, they were females, and this gave them greater independence. Now, again, if Vodafone hadn't done this, there would have been no media backlash against them. However, this is a much better way to create value for society than doing these other things which are splitting the pie differently, even though those other things are still good things. As Matt Peacock, the former group director of Vodafone, said to my MBA students at London Business School, if you put a mobile phone in somebody's hand, you change their life. And so what this means is that when we think about responsibility, we often silo this into a CSR department, which just tries to do things like cutting art carbon emissions. But just to be amazing at the product or service that you are supposed to provide for Vodafone, this is telecom services, that makes a big difference. And why that's so important is that that means, well, for every company, even companies which might not seem to be as outward facing as pharmaceuticals can have a role to play in society. Okay, you think Merck, well, it's easy for them because they're making drugs that change people's lives. But not every company does something like that. Let's think about Network Rail. I choose them because I know they're committed to purpose. All they do is they run the railways. But all they do? Well, that has a huge effect on society. Well, if you've got a great rail network, you connect people to jobs, you give them employment. Maybe people are already in jobs, you allow them to live far away from their jobs, closer to schools and communities. And the whole aspect of, of actually building in a station, that can regenerate communities like we've seen in King's Cross. So this doesn't mean that there's some companies which create value for society, like pharmaceuticals, and there's other companies that don't. All of them create value by being excellent in their core business. There are a few, maybe say, um, say tobacco or, or weapons, which, which might not do that. But this list of companies that by being excellent at what they do, create value is much higher than what we think. And importantly, this matters for all employees. But you might think, well, within Merck, who matters? It's the R&D people, the scientists, they're creating the, job, the, the drugs. But somebody in payroll, by being excellent at what he or she does, that creates tons of value, right? Because that makes sure that employees know that they'll be paid on a timely basis and they don't need to worry about that and they can focus on whatever their action is. So this is important because some of the most pie-growing activities, some of the most excellent things that companies can do will be errors of commission. They might make some people worse off. Like the launch of the ATM, for example, that in the short run may have made some bank workers 
redundant because they were no longer needed to deposit and withdraw checks. And if you were a company and your goal was to avoid any negative media backlash, then you would never do anything, right? Because most of these decisions, at least somebody is going to be worse off. But in fact, the ATM has, has transformed banking. This means that as customers, you are now able to get your money at any time and um, deposit and withdraw without long queues. Actually, workers are now better off, right? Some of you might know David Orta's excellent TED Talk, Why Are There Still So Many Jobs? After the launch of the ATM, the number of bank tellers in the US has increased from a quarter of a million to half a million. Why? Because this grew the pie. This made it cheaper for banks to open more branches. And so they opened way more branches, and that gave more jobs. And also, bank tellers' jobs changed. No longer were they focusing on just depositing and withdrawing money, more routine tasks, but forming interpersonal relationships with the customers and advising them on what bank accounts to open. The second thing, and this is going to be the main thing that I'm just going to end with, is purpose. And this is why we have the title of, the, uh, of today's lecture, Purposeful Business. I've stressed the idea of growing the pie, creating value for society. But this is sort of awfully general. It's very difficult to operationalize. Because how does a particular company, in its own circumstances, create value? What Network Rail does is very different from Merck. And so this is where purpose comes in. A company's purpose is its, its reason for being why it exists for the world, how it contributes to human betterment. And by fulfilling that task, it ultimately becomes profitable. But profit is never the purpose. It's a byproduct of purpose. Now, the most one important thing, an important thing, but not the only, about purpose is how to define it. So a company's purpose includes who it exists for and why it exists. Now, the why has got a lot of attention recently from good books like Start With Why by Simon Sinek. But the who is also important. Which of the stakeholders do you prioritize? Because as I mentioned earlier, many decisions might involve trade-offs. Some people might be better off like customers with the ATM. Others might be work off, worse off like workers temporarily. So you need to define your who. And when you define your purpose, it should be uncomfortable. What do I mean by this is that a purpose cannot be all things to all people. If you had a purpose to serve customers, workers, suppliers, environment, and communities, and generate returns to investors, that is meaningless. That doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me how I'm going to make difficult decisions where there's a trade-off. But Olam, this agribusiness in Singapore, their purpose tells me that they focus on the environment. John Lewis's purpose tells me that they will focus on their employees. So a purpose statement is valuable just as much as what it doesn't include as much as what it does. This is not to say that Olam doesn't care about its workers or John Lewis doesn't care about the environment, but this is more about what is first among equals. So when you have these difficult decisions, this gives you no guidance. This also gives you guidance. Another way in which I view purpose is that purpose is only meaningful if the opposite would also be reasonable. A purpose to serve all of those makes no sense, because you'd never say my purpose is to serve none of them. But a purpose to serve the environment makes sense, because you might instead choose the first among equals as your workers. And that's also true for the why here. Because if your why is for Costco to provide, to prioritize price, price is the most important thing, subject to some quality, that's reasonable. Because the opposite, to make quality the most important thing and price secondary, is also meaningful. That gives direction. But the most important thing about purpose is it must provide trade-offs, highlight what's more important and what's not, because of what I call the principle of materiality. You need to define what are the most material stakeholders to your organization, because some decisions, as I mentioned, involve trade-offs, so who has primacy in those cases? And this is indeed what some people are doing. This is what's known as the materiality map, which shows that for what industries, what are the most material stakeholders? For example, in healthcare and resources, it's the environment. Financials, banks, you don't care so much about the environment, but you do care about data privacy, about transparency to customers.
And this is an interesting study here. What this did is it looked at companies that did well in sustainability measured using a database called KLD. The ones that did really well across the board in every dimension, they didn't beat the market. It wasn't significant. But the ones that did well on the material issues and did not do well on the immaterial issues, they outperformed by 5% per year. So purpose doesn't mean freely abandoning profit and just doing everything you can to benefit society. Purpose is targeted and it's intentional and highlighting those particular issues that you are choosing to focus on. Now, purpose is far more than a statement. You need to live it. And this involves uh, two things. One is to communicate it externally. The second is to embed it internally. So to communicate it, this involves reporting to your investors, not just things like profits and dividends, but metrics on uh, purpose-related issues. So Marks and Spencer focuses on employees. You won't be able to read all of these, but they're reporting on diversity, youth employment, responsible leadership. And they're saying, some of these we've achieved. Some of these were on plan. Some of these we haven't achieved. Hold us accountable for that. And in terms of embedding it internally, I don't have time to do this in the last eight minutes, but fortunately, I have many other lectures within this Gresham series to do this. So this is just a little bit of a preview before the Q&A as to what I'm going to look at. Executive pay is one of the most controversial topics that we see here in, in, in real life. Right? Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton agreed about virtually nothing. But the one thing they both agreed on was that CEOs are being paid too much. So what I'm going to focus on in lecture two is how can we reform executive pay to make sure that executives have the pie growing mentality rather than the pie splitting mentality. Another topic is corporate governance. Corporate governance is how we ensure that companies act for investors and society's interest. And this might involve um, changing how things are done. At the moment, you have board committees for things such as risk and audit and pay, and those things are important. But many companies don't have board committees for human capital or innovation, things that we've talked about today. That will be lecture three. Lecture four is going to move beyond this. But like we want to change companies. But companies are only part, one part of the system. We want to make sure that the change is system-wide. Because companies are accountable to investors. And even if a CEO is really forward-thinking and she thinks she should be purposeful and invest for the long run, she knows that she might be held accountable by investors who are only looking at short-term profit. So we need to make sure that investors, in the way that they govern and choose and manage their, their, their stocks, are different. That is going to be lecture four on the stewardship role of investors. And much of this is taken from a book that I'm currently writing, which, uh, where the tentative title is Grow the Pie, How Enterprises Create Both Profit for Investors and value for society, this new third way, which is hopefully going to be the way in which we're going to stop this conflict, this movie from replaying over and over again. So to sum up before the Q&A, what is a responsible business? It's not necessarily one that doesn't earn much profit or um, pays its CEO little, but one that grows the pie, creates value for society, and it can become profitable as a byproduct. The evidence suggests this is not a too-good-to-be-true pipe dream, but it does happen in reality. As a society, we should hold companies to account, but not necessarily for splitting the pie in different ways and committing errors of commission, such as maybe the launch of ATM puts some people out of work, but on pie growing and errors of omission, are you coasting and sticking with the status quo? A responsible business should be one that pursues excellence, is important in its core business, and is driven by purpose. But purpose should not just be a nice mission statement, it should be embedded in how a company operates, and that's going to be the topic of the next three lectures. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer questions, and questions can be challenging ones, including if you disagree with anything I've said. But thank you so much for being so attentive for the last hour. <laughs>